This is um, week four. It's the last one of the American Gulag. And uh, if you notice on that handout there, the title, The Hamitic Curse, Curse of Ham, is really what that represents. And this is because, uh, you know, the, and, and I got the Bible here. I mean, I brought Genesis with me. Uh, First time I've used a Bible at a talk in a long time. But hey, you know, stranger things than that have happened. And, uh, you know, when, when, when you get into the, the, the slave trade, and this, this actually, this, this handout was interesting to write be, because of the research that was involved with it. And, and where you go here with, there you go, you know, where you go here with the justification for slavery. You know, for Arabs and Moors who were engaged in the slave trade, they could care less if the bodies were white, black, tan, polka dotted. They could care less. Uh, it's the bodies to do the work. However, interesting as as you know, the you know, the West is coming out of out of out of the Dark Ages into the Middle Ages and eventually the Renaissance, exploration, so on and so forth. Uh, there is, there, there, they will get into a justification here uh, for, for using blacks or people of different color uh, for slaves. And one of those different colors will be when they come over here, uh, the Indian, I mentioned that before, that the Indian did not make a great slave, mainly because the men had been braves and they're not going to start picking cotton because, you know, uh, agricultural work, that's women's work. I'm a brave, we don't do that. And so they really weren't very good at it. And the other problem with the red man is if he escapes, you know, in North America, if he escapes, he's on his own home turf. And you get enough of them together, they could form a guerrilla band. And you don't want to do that. So, And then the British would, some got, got to the point where the British would take some of the Indians and then export them to the Caribbean. Mm. Not a, not a place to go in, those, in that time because uh, that the Caribbean, Central America, beca because of the climate, that, that, those areas ate slaves like peanuts. And so you had that constant trade going with Africa, so on and so forth. But interesting here, when, when you look at, uh, at the Portuguese, and I noticed, and I mentioned here, Christians on the Iberian Peninsula came to view blacks as destined by God to be, and this is an actual quote, the hewers of wood and carriers of water. Interesting here. And so when you go back to the Bible, which is where they're going to go to justify this, keep in mind there were a number of papal bulls, you know, as ex exploration is gaining steam here, there are a number of papal bulls uh, you know, Vatican, the Vatican, papal bulls coming out, uh, decreeing that these people were to be in service of the Christian movement. And they're virtually second-class citizens in their own lands to justify exploration. Why? Of course, the church is going to get a cut of the action, too. <laughs> you know, and, and keep in mind here, with regards to the Renaissance here, uh, you know, again, getting back into how, how, did, how, did the Europe, how did the rise of the Europeans, how did this come about? You know, the Renaissance, a lot of this was powered by the gold and the silver. The Spanish, especially the Spanish and the Portuguese, are shipping back to Europe. You know, these people are spending this money like it's going out of style. So it filters out of the Iberian Peninsula. And it's going to help to power the Renaissance. And so the Renaissance, in a way, is powered off the backs of the so-called untermensch that live in Central and South America. In other words, a lot of these Indians to start with, even before blacks. Interesting here. But when you go to, you know, uh, uh, again here I, I write, yet at the same time Christians seem to gravitate toward biblical passages concerning the sons of Noah. And so when you look at Genesis 9.20, and this is what they use here, interesting, interesting, uh, Genesis 9.20. And Noah began to be a, husband, a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. All right, so Noah is setting up shop here. But then again, 
And Ham, Ham is one of his sons. Ham the, fa Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren throughout. Since Shem and Japheth, two of Noah's sons, saw not their father's nakedness, they were absolved from the resulting curse. For according to Genesis 9.24 and 9.25, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew his son's transgression, he cursed Canaan as, servants of servants shall, be, shall he be among his brethren. In other words, you know, th this leads to, this leads to the, 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 the question here, well, his son saw his father naked, big deal, so what? But is there something more to this? Is there a transgression here, which I don't have to go into. I'm sure you can figure that one out. Is that, is that why there's a curse? It's murky. It's murky. There's really no explanation here. There's no explanation really in the Bible. And again, right, strict from the Bible. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done, done unto him. What did his son do? What does that lead you to think? It's really not explained here. And no, and it's Noah. He said, Cursed be Canaan, and servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And so when you look at, you know, Ham, Noah's son, is supposed to be the person who oversees Canaan, you get to this extent where even the Arabs say that, that, that Ham was a derivative of people from East Africa? How do you get to that? Which means what? Are they darker skinned? And so is this why the blacks have this curse to be slaves? You know, are they, are, is religion being used here to justify this? It's all very murky. I mean, it's all, where's the proof of this? Where's the, apparently you don't need any proof. Apparently, you don't need proof. What do you need proof for? You need these bodies to do the work. And so even among, and I put here, even among medieval Arabs importing slaves from East Africa to the Middle East, the emphasis shifted from Canaan to Ham, a person in particular, widely believed to be the ancestor of all Africans. And the physical result of the curse became these people become black, the blackening of the skin. Well, what's the blackening of the skin supposed to mean? The curse. You believe this stuff? Any, any justification to okay some ugly, ugly uh, pursuit like slavery? It, it's unbelievable here. And like I said, the papal bulls were exacted you know, not against just blacks, but against various peoples in these, in these areas that they're colonizing here, who were considered to be, subs to be, to be workers or people who were going to be utilized in whatever form to justify the Christian agenda. What would you call that? Slavery, uh, you know, uh, 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 reducing these people to, to, the, to the utmost existence. What were the Nazis doing to, to Jewish people and Slavs in the early 1940s? Weren't the Nazis Christian? Hitler was Catholic. Whether you like it or not, he was a Catholic. Interesting here. Not a very good Catholic, I'll give you that. I mean, even Stalin went to a seminary. His mother sent him there. Of course, he became radicalized. Called his left the seminary, called his mother a bitch, and didn't see her for 40 years. And so interesting here, interesting here, uh, where, where people take these things. Yes?
Yeah. Well, are you supposed to take this stuff literally? Yeah, but you don't. Do you, but do you get an explanation in the Bible itself? Well, it really doesn't explain when I was discussing here. I mean, there, there, there is no, there is no note. Go to the rear of the book for the end notes. There's none of that. Right. Right. But then again, don't people, and I'm sure you know people who do this, don't they cherry pick what they really want to follow in their religion and then forget about other aspects of it? Okay, you go back to the Quran. And if a mother and father, it's in the Quran, if a mother and father die, and the children get, the children, you know, divide up the spoils for an inheritance, right? Women are included here. Girls are included here. Now, do you honestly think, though, that the Taliban would observe that? Do you honestly think the Islamic State would observe that? I don't think so. Why? Now you've got clannish and tribal reasons why they won't, because in that area of the world, Many, many, many of those areas of the world, who has primacy here? Men. Mm. And so, go, yeah, but again, you find this in the Quran. Oh, I don't think Christians or Jewish people are any different. Many, many, you know people, they're going to pick and choose what they want to follow. And so, and they'll dispense with the rest of it for a matter of convenience or whatever other reason. But however, you know, considering, considering this, you know, getting back to the slave issue here and how blacks were consigned to this, it does strengthen that outlook in this country, even before it's a country, that blacks are what? Inferior, right? Yeah, of course it does. Second class citizens. Second class citizens, it strengthened that. It's hard to break old habits even to the extent that when they're forming this country, you can find this in your constitution, it's right in your constitution, it's black and white, where even though these people are property, property, southern representatives to Congress are accorded the three-fifths compromise where each slave is considered a three-fifths a three of a person when counting up representation for Congress. Boy, that, talk about having your cake and eating it too. People can, these living and breathing toil, living and breathing property, these unpaid toilers who are black, considered property, but for representation purposes in Congress can be considered three-fifths of a person. But then again, who checks that? And keep in mind when they're putting this country together, they want the North and the South to come together. This issue of slavery, well, we'll kick that can down the road and we'll solve it later on. Well, you know how it's going to be solved. But go back to 1776, go back to 1780, go back to 1787, go back to 1788. You know how they're going to solve this. They, again, they kick the can down the road. But this isn't to say that all blacks went quietly here. Uh, you know, you, 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 ha you actually had here the Nathaniel Bacon Rebellion in 1676. It'll be brutally put down in Virginia. There was also a revolt in 1811, just prior to the War of 1812. Louisiana, Mississippi, and upwards of 40 blacks were shot or lynched to put this down. You know, and keep in mind, too, that when you had the, the, the successful black revolution on Haiti, Toussaint, Louverture, so on and so forth, that was not publicized here. I mean, blacks throwing Europeans out. That's big. That is big. Throwing the French out, the British too. I mean, that's big. 
but you can't publicize that here, especially the Southerners won't do that. Why? Establish a trend here? That's not what they want. Interesting, too, in 1826, in the, in a, in the Congress in Panama, when many of these Central American, uh, the new, these new republics were getting together to try to form a supranational organization. Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Peru, uh, Colombia, Grand Colombia then, because there was no Venezuela. You know, all these countries go here and try to form an organization. But even here among these people, ardent nationalism will, will keep them, will prevent them from forming this group. However, the United States Congress wanted to send two representatives from Congress to this conference. But the South filibustered. Why? Because these people down South outlawed slavery. And so the South filibustered. By the time, by the time the North was able to break the filibuster, and they send two congressmen, one of them dies en route, and a representative named Sargent gets there, the conference is over. The Congress was over. And guess who else went here? Observer status, the British. Guess what they were able to do? Ink trade deals with these republics at our expense. But because these, and keep in mind too, why do you think when blacks were escaping slavery here, going to Canada? Canada was part of the British Empire becomes part of the Commonwealth. They had out, the slavery had been outlawed. That's where they're gonna go. Or places like in upstate New York, perhaps, where uh, there were hotbeds of people who were ignoring the law anyway, and blacks went there. Interesting here, interesting, interesting how this, how this is. And then, there, and then, there, and then there's revolts. Uh, there was the periodic revolt on ships off the African coast, and I brought one up in particular that I found, a ship named the Nancy. And in 1769, 132 slaves revolted on this ship. And then blacks here on shore, hearing the gunfire, <laughs> jumped into their canoes, went out to the Nancy, and joined the blacks who were revolting. And then liberated, helped to liberate the blacks on the ships who were revolting against the against the crew of the ship. Of course, they savaged the ship. So there were instances such as that. And then there's legal, legal law actions here too, like the Dred Scott decision of 1857. Now that's an interesting case. That's a very interesting case. <laughs> a Dr. John Emerson in 1834, who joins the army, he's from St. Louis, but he gets transferred up to Illinois. And he has a manservant with him, who's really a slave, Dred Scott. And so Illinois is a free state. And Dred Scott decides he wants to try to free himself. And since Illinois is not a slave state, it is a free state, what do you think Dred Scott is thinking? How can I be a slave in a free state? and he'll take the case to court. He's going to lose that case. Now the Supreme Court is going to rule, and the members, some members of the Supreme Court will rule against them. I'll keep in mind there were some Southerners on the Supreme Court. But the idea here is, if he is allowed to win this case, what do you think the ramifications of this are for the South? Especially, especially after the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 when Stephen Douglas, Stephen Douglas was a commissioner for arranging new territories. Remember him, the Jefferson, the, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates? Yeah, sure. And so he didn't think the Missouri Compromise was justified, so he thought, he thought, they, they, and they were able to do this, that Kansas, which should come in, However, the settlers decide it should come in. You know, it's not going to be deemed a free state or a slave state. Douglas thought 
Douglas thought that the people who settled there should decide the issue. And they thought, since, since some of the territory surrounding Kansas, it's a no-brainer. It's going to come in as a free state anyway. So why not let the people decide that? That's not how it's going to turn out to be. Slave traders are going to flock. Slaveholders are going to flock to Kansas. There will be people who are free staters who are going to go to Kansas. And it's going to wind up being known as Bloody Kansas. And you can look at it this way if you would like. Kansas as a battleground is kind of a tune-up for what's going to happen here in 1861. Because who else flocks there as this gets started? John Brown. John Brown. And I kind of look on this, you know, when you look at what happens in Kansas here, and as a tune-up to the American Civil War, the Spanish Civil War later on down the road winds up being a tune-up for what? 1939, for the Second World War. Because the Germans and Italians help Franco, and the Russians are helping the Republicans. And they're testing their weapons, they're testing their troops here. Well, what do you think they're doing in Kansas? Some of these guys who wind up fighting in Kansas, either pro or anti-slave, wind up in the armies of the North and the South in 1861. Wow. Interesting here. Yeah, interesting here too, you know, when, when you know, uh, what um, Roger Taney says, Chief Justice Robert Taney with regards to Dred Scott, when the Constitution was adopted, get a load of this one. When the Constitution was adopted, Negroes were regarded as persons of an inferior order and not as citizens. And they were not intended to be included by constitutional provision giving to, giving to citizens of different rights to be able to, the right to sue in federal courts. Hmm. Roger Taney was also one of those in 1832 that helped uh, uh, Andrew Jackson kill the Bank of the United States. <laughs> and so here, it's, it seems like even, even if they're not really Southerners, it's stacked against blacks. Because keep in mind, to help keep the country together, the fugitive slave laws, even if a black is in New York, Rhode Island, whatever the case may be, the authorities can pick him up and take him back to his owner. And interestingly enough, right after the Dred Scott case, there was a case in Boston. The slave's name was Arthur Burns. He was, he was making his way through the Underground Railroad. The only thing is, he gets caught. Well, after, after this case, there were many abolitionists up here in the north. People are now flocking to the abolitionists. And as Arthur Burns is being picked up to be sent back south, all of a sudden, dozens, hundreds, even thousands turn out in Boston to stop it. They have to bring in the militia. They even have to bring in some Marines to get this guy on the boat because the people revolted against the idea of Burns being sent back. Somebody estimated the cost of bringing one slave back to the South in 1854, or 1857 rather. And somebody said, it, uh, doing some research on this, said it cost uh, the equivalent of $100,000 to send one guy back because the people took to the streets. And they had a call on the militia and then even the Marines to escort this guy to the ship and take him back. And it's at this point here, keep in mind too, where people up north are going with it. I'm not talking about the authorities, I'm talking about the people. 
Democratic Party, prior to 1858, prior to 1858, there were like 91 Democrats in the House of Representatives from the North. Two years later, the next elections, there's 25. People are moving to what party here? The Republican Party. The South doesn't like this. Even at one point, they were moving to the know-nothings. That was another party that didn't last long. And so they're moving to the Republican Party, a party which has on its platform here equality of rights, supposedly, yet that has to be called into question, too. Abraham Lincoln. Remember him? The emancipator of slaves. Abraham Lincoln came late to the party of deinstitutionalizing slavery. In fact, I was doing some research on pronouncements he made prior to the war. Funny what you find here. A number of pronouncements prior and after his becoming the 16th president call into question the accepted notion by many that Lincoln was an ardent opponent of slavery at the outset of the war. Uh, he wasn't. During an address at Columbus, Ohio on September 16, 1859, Lincoln begins to refute remarks implied by a journalist in the Statesman newspaper, among which was, in debating with Senator Douglas, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, during that memorable debate last fall, Mr. Lincoln declared in favor of Negro suffrage and attempted to defend the vile conception against the little giant, to which Lincoln replies, I mention this now at the opening of my remarks for the purpose of making three comments upon it. Upon it. The first I have already announced. It furnishes me an introductory topic. And then he says, I will say here while on the subject that I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it already exists. That's what he says. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. That's Lincoln. There is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment, get a load of this, will probably forever forbid their living together upon a footing of perfect equality. This is Lincoln. I agree with Judge Douglas. He, the black man, is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color, perhaps not in moral or intellectual endowments, but in the right to eat the bread, eat the bread, but leave of, of anyone else, which, which his own hand earns, in other words, his, he's earning his daily bread, he is my equal, and the equal of Judge Douglas, and the equal of every living man. And I found this in Lincoln's writings and a book on Lincoln's, Lincoln's writings and Lincoln's speeches. I got, I got a couple of books on these. They're interesting to read. But then again, I will say that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes nor of qualifying them to hold office or intermarry with white people. That's pretty strong stuff, huh? That's pretty strong stuff. Keep in mind, this is 1859. Has the war started yet? No. No. And so, you know, when the war starts, supposedly for, one, uh, for the Southerners, it's states' rights which isn't going to last long because the state's rights means each state has, has, has its individual uh, characteristics, which is going to disappear when they build a strong central government by 1862 because they have to build in a military industrial complex. That's the end of the South as far as being the champions of state's rights. It dies in total war is what happens here. Yes, sir. Well, I, 
Yeah, bouncing off what you're saying here, it shows you that he's a politician. Well, you know, he, he's playing both sides of the fence. While the black man perhaps is his equal, you know, going, going back to the daily bread from what he earns, that's fine, but am I pushing the, speaking of as Lincoln, am I pushing the agenda of blacks and whites getting married? Am I pushing the agenda of blacks becoming jurors? No, so he's, right, January 1863, right, which eventually leads to what? The, the, the black man getting the right to vote by 1870. But then again, when you look at this, you know, is this also done, you know, politicians being politicians, is this done for convenience? Now, keep in mind, the war casualties are rising here, and we want this war over. And so what do you do? Maybe get the blacks to rise up, which they're not going to do, although 180,000 will join the federal army and put on a blue uniform. And this is where Frederick Douglass states, uh, don't have freedom given to you, go fight for it. You know, it does make a difference when people shed blood for something they want. Correct, especially if he got captured. Right. So, it, so it, yeah, that, that's an, it, it's an interesting point you bring up. But then, but then again, Mr. Lincoln, yeah, he's a politician. But then again, when you read this, uh, you know, you're walking into a minefield here back then. And so, you know, Lincoln's, I, you know, Lincoln's idea in 1861, and he repeats, the idea isn't to destroy slavery, but it is to put the country together. And so he's actually walking in the footsteps then in that regard, just like his, the founders were. Okay, we'll kick the can down the road. We'll kick the can down. But the Civil War is going to force him to take a different course as it goes along here. Yes? <laughs> Part of this is because they wanted to build a railroad from Chicago to the West Coast. And so um, interesting, interesting how that is because of the fact building a railroad from Chicago to the West Coast, if the North is able to do this, uh, what are those states... What are those states west of Chicago going to be coming in as? Yeah, free. South doesn't like that. And so the, the, the Southerners try to filibuster that idea. And so, uh, and so here you, again, you get that Kansas-Nebraska Act where, you know, Stephen Douglas is one of those representing the interest for the railroads. Well, that's part of this. And so, okay, well, why don't we let Kansas come in as a state, but let the people who settle Kansas decide? And they, everyone thought, well, it's going to be decided as a free state. Well, no, it's not, because slave tr slaveholders, slave traders are going to go in there. Well, you know, they, 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 these people are realists, too, to a certain extent. They know as you go west, is this prime territory for growing cotton? Are you going to be able to grow cotton in Nebraska? You need 200 frostless days to do this. You're not going to do that. You can do it in Mississippi. You can do it in Louisiana. You can do it in Arkansas. You can do it in Texas. But you can't do it in these other states. Part, yes, that's, a lot of that is what this is because Kansas is a hub before you go west. And so at the same time here, the Southerners are thinking here, well, if they're going to stop us from from having slavery in Kansas, then eventually they're going to stop us from having slavery in Missouri, in Mississippi, in South Carolina. But then again, it, it, this might not have to be because of the Industrial Revolution. No, it, it, the, the practice is dying anyway. Capitalism, technology, uh, and, uh, landed gentry, they're dying at this point. They are really dying. And so when the war, end of the war comes about, the end of the Civil War, going back to what I mentioned earlier about states' rights. I mean, Southerners will talk about this all the time, states' rights. They were the champions of states' rights. Sounds democratic, it sounds representative, whatever the case may be. However, events overtake them. And you can see the one of the turning points of this conflict is when George B. McClellan 
invades the Virginia Peninsula in 1862 with a huge army of 100,000 men in an amphibious operation that kind of presages what's going to happen down the road at places like Gallipoli, Sicily, Normandy, Okinawa. They move hundreds and hundreds of ships and barges down the Potomac to land troops, mules, horses, supplies in the Virginia Peninsula. But the idea, and this is what Lincoln wants, let's take Richmond now and get this over with. The problem here is McClellan was a talented guy except for one thing. He was a plotter. He thought he was up against 100,000 Confederates. You know how many Confederates jo General Johnston had on that peninsula? 12,000 men. McClellan thought he was up against a like number. He wasn't, and he was slow. But what happens here is, knowing, his, knowing that federal troops are on the Virginia Peninsula, what does Jefferson Davis do? He evacuates Richmond, leaves Richmond in the care of a General John B. W James B. Winder, who institutes martial law. And here you begin to see the real centralized control of government. Martial law. You have to have a passport to get in and out of your hotel. You have to have a pass to get in on and off the train. Have a passport to get on and off the stagecoach. He has to know who's coming in and who's coming out. You're not free anymore. In fact, in fact, Southerners have to report their firearms to the Ordnance Bureau. Imagine that, Southerners. You go, down there, you go down to the South today and you tell some Southern, Southern fella that you're going to take his gun. How do you think that's going to work? Yeah, not well, he says. But this is what happens when you have centralized control of a country in total war. And that's where this is going, total war. And so the idea of states' rights is dying here even to the extent that the government will take control of, of, of the economy. For instance, the, the small farmer has to give up a certain percentage of his grain and his livestock to feed the army. Well, you have to do that, especially if you've got a cruddy currency and you, the farmer's paying taxes and the currency isn't worth anything. So you will go in physically and grab some of the grain and the livestock. And then they take over northern, northern uh, arsenals, and then they begin to elaborate on these arsenals to begin producing arms on their own. But they have to have the metal. They have to have the powder and the wood for the stocks and the guns. So you organize, centralize. What happened to states' rights? It's dying. And so what's happening here to the landed gentry? The people who controlled these slaves? People are moving from the countryside into the city to man the factories. And so what happened to Southern provincialism, ruralism? It's dying. What's taking its place? Urbanization. And you begin to see the industrialization of the South. Who needs slaves? Now you have to pay people to work. <laughs> That's what's beginning to happen here. And so this Southern aristocracy, which had this marvelous realm here, of too much land and too few hands and controlled the politics and the money, they're dying here in the face of an industrialized war. And so the Southern, the southern aristocracy, America's version of the Russian boyer, the landed gentry, is a mirror image of what's gonna happen to 50 years, 60 years down the road, the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, the Romanovs, and the Ottomans. They're all going to disappear. Why? Modern war. Yet, with modern war, so-called emancipation of the black man, how did that work out after Reconstruction for them in 1877? You know, when the Northerners pulled the troops out, how do you enforce Reconstruction and enforce the laws of the Constitution? You're going to leave that to the Southerners? What do you think happens to the black man here? He's reduced to second-class citizenship. He's really not free. Poll taxes, 
other forms of discouragement for voting. You know, and our movies really don't show this. A lot of black men went west to become cowboys. Cattle drives. How about buffalo soldiers? Remember that one? Sure. Became cavalrymen. Some wound up working on ranches. But that's never reflected in our cowboy movies. Extremely rare that it is. John Ford did that once with a movie. Uh, I forgot the name of the movie. It was made in the late 50s. Um, and there was a, a white officer who was in command of a black cavalry reg regiment. And one of Woody Strode was in it. If you remember him, he used to play for the Los Angeles Rams. He was a he made a lot of movies in the 50s. He was in the man who shot Liberty Valance. He played John Wayne's assistant on the farm. Woody Strode. And he was accused of, of, of raping this white woman, and it wasn't true. And Jeff Hunter, remember him? Yeah, Jeffrey Hunter. He was the he defended this black man in the military court. It's an interesting movie. It's, one of, it's, it's a different movie for John Ford, but that's one of the few movies that goes into black soldiers in the 19th century as cavalrymen out west. So we really don't show that. We really don't. Something missing here. Yes. You know, what's interesting here, too, is remember, John, remember General Pershing? John J. Pershing. What was his nickname? Yeah, Why? Because he commanded a black cavalry unit. He, that's why they call him, uh, they call him General per Black Jack Pershing. In fact, when he went to France as the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, Georges Clemenceau, the president of France, wanted to know what is this with this uh, what is this with this nickname Black Jack? And Pershing tried to explain it, and I guess it went over Clemenceau's head. I guess he just didn't. Didn't get it too well, uh, but that was why, he because he was he commanded a black cavalry unit or buffalo soldiers as they used to be called, and they fought in the Spanish American War by the way, uh, black soldiers. Interesting. And this brings up things like Jim Crow. How do you get to this thing, Jim Crow? You know how this really starts. Uh, it's reputed to have started uh, in places like actually Boston. In 1790, where you begin to have people, you know, in stage play, you know, blackface, so on and so forth, right? Uh, showcasing blacks in various various guises, and this begins to take this begins to take off. Uh, minstrel shows, if you want to use that term, 1820, 1830, showcasing blacks as they are then. And you see this carried forward into the 20th century. Uh, you know, the black maybe not, maybe dressed shabbily in some of these plays, uh, you know. And, and so the uneducated uh, black who's in some cases made fun of, uh, Jim Crow, the name pops up, is used to, uh, used to, uh, to name these laws that come up. Keeping, you know, Southerners keeping blacks in line with so-called Jim Crow laws, which are really extra legal here. Ku Klux Klan pops up. Now, the Ku Klux Klan is one of those I like to call, uh, and I, you know, it kind of, uh, the, you, could, you can compare them to a certain extent to the Fry Corps in Germany in 1918, 1919. Uh, I call them armies of the uprooted and disinherited. The Ku Klux Klan actually shares something with the Fry Corps. Both come out of a, of a war from the nation that lost the war. Well, the Fry Corps were, and another thing they share with the, with the Fry Corps, the Klan does, they're both to the right. And so the Fry Corps were actually German soldiers, Men who lost their jobs right after the war, they have to eat, don't they? Sure, they have to eat. So they join these groups known as Fry Corps, or Free Corps if you want. Many of these guys, some had, again, some have been soldiers, some are out of work, 
Some are listless, they're luckless, they don't know where they're going in a, con in a, con in a country where the political, political situation is unstable, the economy has been savaged, uh, they don't know where they're going. However, the army, having lost the war really, and having been you know, reduced, in, in, reduced in manpower, you know, Versailles is gonna, tell the Germ is gonna stipulate the Germans can't have an army more than 100,000 men. But with the Fry Corps, and over 70 of these sprout up in Germany. And guess what the political affiliation is? The starboard side of the boat. And so they are going to be the ones used to crack down on the communists. And they're actually in the employ here of the army. They get their, many of their guns from the army. Some of the, some of the leaders of these Fry Corps groups sprinkled all over Germany some of them have been cashiered, or some are active duty officers in the German Army and even the Navy. Well, go back to the Ku Klux Klan. Many of the Klansmen were what? Veterans of the defunct Confederate Army, still believing in Southernism. Interesting here, too, with the Klan. Eh. You know, they, all, they also want to purge the, this purge the South of carpetbaggers, scallywags, they used to call people, and they don't, they're not a fan of freedom for blacks. Interesting here, in 1867 in Nashville, the Ku Klux Klan convened as an invisible empire in the South. It was overseen by the Grand Wizard. Remember that one? Yeah. However, realms or states were ruled by the Grand Dragon each state or realm. Note the term realm. Provinces and counties, a grand titan. Smaller dens, instead of saying a cell, they're a den, run by, the, run by a grand cyclops. And so they will intimidate carpetbaggers, they'll intimidate blacks. And it could be intimidating to see them showing up at night on your front doorstep in white robes and white hoods, or burning, yeah, and, bur and or burning a cross, right? And so, and another reason that you know that's intimidating the garb they're wearing, but it also hides their their ID from the authorities, whether it's federal troops, whether it's the police, whatever the case may be. And so, they're supposedly disbanded in 1869, but they're really not. And so even though, and, that, and then in the 1920s, you know, they begin to eschew in some of these states the white robes and begin to wear suits and ties. And some states get elected to Congress. But by 1928, uh, their influence is really beginning to wane here. I remember going back to the 80s when I used to competitively shoot. And I, there was a gunsmith I used to use, but he lived up in Meriden. And he was manufacturing a barrel for me. And I called him, I said, Frank, he, Frank, he calls me up and I, he says, your barrel's done. And I said, all right. I said, when can I come up? I said, is next Saturday okay? He says, yeah, fine. And he, you know, so I was supposed to be up there like 10, 10, 11 in the morning, pick up the barrel. And he calls me back. He goes, hey, Mark, there's going to be a Klan rally here in Meriden next Saturday. He says, I said, I'll come up anyway. He says, well, just be advised. He said, there might be some traffic here. I said, all right. So I left like an hour earlier, and I get into Marin, and I'm driving through, and, I, and they're, and they're in, a, they're in a, a, a playground next to a school. And I get there, and there's 12 guys with an American flag and a cross. It's not burning, though, and a cross. And there's 12 guys standing there, one in front of a microphone. And they're in the white robes, and they got the hoods on, right? And there were about 100 other people there, all cops. There was no one else there. And so the, whoever it was, the grand poobah here, who's standing in front of the microphone talking, he's talking to 100 cops state troopers, and Meriden police. And I drove by, and I, and I laughed as I drove by, and I got to Frank's house, and, he, and we 
I had a cup of coffee and we were talking a little bit. He goes, did you see the rally? I said, yeah. I said, there's about, I don't know, about 112, 115 people there. I said, I saw 12 Klansmen. I said, the rest are all cops. He starts to laugh. He goes, yeah. He said, that happened before. But he says, you never know. You might get the opposition to show up, and then that's why you have all the policemen there. You know, you have to do that, I guess. Uh, but yeah, they, they kind of lost, they lost their, they kind of lost their, their, their presence here. But not in the beginning. Although today, you know, groups, there are groups out now like Daily Stormer, um, Vanguard America, Otto Waffen, who are really to the right. Uh, they not only like dislike blacks and Latinos, they hate Jewish people. They don't, they don't like their own mothers, for crying out loud. They're that far to the right. And they've kind of taken over here, at least popularity-wise, for the Klan. Of course, there's other reasons why they've showed up. But it seems that with this thing known as slavery, the black man has assumed, it seems that it's, it's still ongoing here, they are still second-class citizens after 400 years. Considering for, this is the, you know, it's 400 years ago this year that the Dutch brought the first 20 blacks here as laborers. It's being polite here, laborers. But, you know, uh, it, it's, we haven't really overcome this yet. And so when you look at your founders, you know, uh, keeping slavery in the hopes of doing away with it later on, and then you look at the Civil War later on, and the end of Reconstruction, it doesn't stop blacks being second-class citizens, even with constitutional amendments applied. The naturalization of blacks, you know, in 1868, the black man being able to vote, 1870, uh, it still hasn't, it's still, blacks are still second-class citizens in many respects. Take a look at pay scales and things of this nature, education, so on and so forth. And what's really hurt blacks now is another, one of the things that's really hurt blacks is that many of the jobs they had in the inner cities, where have they gone? Right, right. And what's happened to cities like Detroit, parts of St. Louis, Camden, Newark, yeah. And you know, you know who's, uh, you're correct, and you know who, but you know who's investing in Detroit? China. <laughs> uh, yes, they are. They're, they're, they are the quintessential capitalists. And so, uh, yeah. So it's interesting here where we've gone from 1619 with regard to the black man here. Yes. Not to the extent we should be. We're, uh, the, the, the Your representative government may be a name. I mean, you know, you can get back to, um, I had this discussion the other night when I was giving a talk on uh, the analysis of the midterm elections. That was a fun one. And, you know, I mentioned the fact that, well, you know, Somebody mentioned that, well, didn't the voter put Trump in? I said, well, okay, if you want to go that route. However, uh, if you remember, the current occupant of the Oval Office vilified Goldman Sachs, virtually calling it a Hillary sat trap. And yet after he takes the oath of, oath of office, he's got to take eight of them on in his administration, or else he's not elected. That's how, that's, or it's not, he's going to be out of office. That's how it works in this country now. Yeah, then what? Then what? I mean, the fact of the matter is, unless you have a functioning system of representative government, none of that's going to work. Well, the people have to be more assertive. I mean, I got into a, dis I got into a discussion with one of these people at this talk. I said, I said, do you honestly think voting matters? Yeah, really. If you're not, if you, if all these people, most people, most Americans, if they vote, those who do vote, keep in mind, 53.3% percent of Americans voted in the 2016 presidential election, and all of that hoopla about, uh, you know, this this last midterm election, 115 million Americans turned out. That is the large. That's 32 million more than turned out for the 2014 midterms. Do you know that's the largest turnout since 1914? 
Yeah, Wow is right. That's the largest turnout since 1914, and yet, you know, that's it. That's it. But keep in mind, back then, you had people voting for socialists. You had people vote... Well, yeah, the, the, yeah, 1919, yeah, um, Palmer did a lot of that. Yeah, with, with the 1919, 1920 Red Scare, remember that one? <laughs> right. Well, no, but I mean, I, but I mean the, the, the times have changed here. And so uh, having a functioning system of representative government means citizen participation. And you don't, you're not seeing that. And you, you can go vote, that's fine. But unless you're writing your congressman, unless you're emailing your senator, unless you're calling them up, unless you're going to a meeting, unless you're writing a letter to the editor or writing letters to the editor, unless this is done in bulk, you know what, you know, you know what voting means? Zero. That's what it means. You know, there's the old saying here, and it's true. You don't control the streets, you don't control the voting booth. That worked in 1776, didn't it? Mm-hmm. It's reality. It's reality here. You, 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 re, you really want to get one of them to sit up? And I did this with Himes. And I, I sent him a letter one time, a, a three-page letter. And I stated how we're a corporate state. Holy Christmas, you think I stabbed him. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, well, I thought he was a Goldman Sachs graduate. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, Christmas, holy, he wrote me a letter back. And we went back and forth with this. And I mentioned, I said, I, I said, I said that I mentioned your alma mater, Goldman Sachs. Boy, that was the end of that. And he still says hi to me. Politician. Well, I remember a couple of these, our, our, our representatives and senators to Harford. And I remember 10 years ago, one of them telling me that, you know, uh, going back to the financial crisis on Wall Street, uh, the mortgage crisis, and one of them told me the problem is we put too many of our eggs in one basket. And now with, because many of these guys lived where? In Greenwich. And so if you look at where your money, going back to your money going to Harford, 45% of the budget comes out of this county alone. 15% comes out of Greenwich alone. And so when some of these guys lost their jobs who lived in Greenwich, uh, what do you think happened to Hartford? And so are we feeling this now? Uh-huh. But then again, I add to they finally did the budget for the Defense Department after 27 years of having, uh, supposedly having to do it when you go back to the 1990 Chief Financial Officers Act, and the Pentagon never really did the budget. And last year they did. And it was done just before Thanksgiving. And there is a question here as to the fate or whereabouts. This is over a period of years, understand, uh, $21 trillion. Now, uh, you don't think that's not going to impact the states? Where's that money? Was this poor accounting procedures? You know, again, you go back to where is the money? Well, you're getting back to what this gentleman over here was alluding to here with a statewide property tax. Well, I, you know, if, I'm sure you remember back in the 80s when it was first uh, brought up about having a state income tax. It would only last three years. Remember that? Three years. Yeah, and I remember I went up there. I wasn't, I, wasn't automat I wasn't automatically opposed to a state income tax, but them telling us it's only going to last three years. Because once it's in, what happens? Right. Right. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, it's, uh, our state is one of those states where there's more leaving than entering. Um. In New Hampshire, it's the other way around. There were more people entering than leaving. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is true. It is true. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, when, when, when you look at the, at the, you know, and going back to the money again and talking about, you know, uh, blacks as second-class citizens, uh, you know, 
social programs to help these people along. What do you think's happening to some of that? You know, some of that money's going by the wayside. So, but, but then again, um, is that a sign of the times in your politics? Yeah, yeah. And so if we're supposed to be a country, the United States, note the word United States, uh, shouldn't that be emblematic of people, no matter who they are, being part of this community? One would think. But then again, I forget the racial end of this. What about things like red states versus blue states? Uh, again, George Washington comes to mind here. He says he was opposed to parties. Democrats, Republicans, but then again, Democrats and Republicans. You know, when, they see, when you hear this thing, Democrats and Republicans are so divided, are they really? They make sure the Green Party can't get on the debates, don't they? They agree on something. They agree on something. And so, uh, and so and they seem to agree on Venezuela, don't they, for the most part. And so, uh, yeah, they agree on certain things, certain things. Uh, but at the same time here, uh, this, this division, uh, red states versus blue states, north versus south, coast, you know, the coast versus uh, the middle of the country. Uh, yeah, there's divisions in this country. So are we, are we going to be able to overcome this? How are you going to overcome all these divisions that seem like they're sprouting here? What do we do? Turn out to be Yugoslavia where we need a Tito? Getting back to representative government again. And so if you're going to have a system of representative government, then people have to be legitimately represented. And that's going to be up to the citizen to figure that out. Don't, th don't think they're going to figure that out for you. That's not your, you'll be, don't hold your breath. Don't hold your breath. So, uh, don't, to squatch the, the Dred Scott, I honestly don't know the exact vote count. Although I do know that many of these justices wrote their own opinions. And by writing their own opinions, they, they virtually disavowed, really, the Dred, Dred Scott's case because they didn't want to tear the country apart. They're still they were still trying to maintain that unity here. Correct. He's not a citizen, in other words. Right. Forget second class. He's not even a citizen. He's property. And even though, even though Mr. Scott, and Mr. Scott makes a point here, through, 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 his, rep, through, his, through his lawyer, he makes a point here, 7-2 decision? Well, it's a pretty strong case. But the fact of the matter is that even though he makes the case, how can I be a slave if I'm in a free state? Right, yeah, I mean, you, you, haven't, you haven't really gotten to that point. Although, although on the, ground, the, ground, the grassroots, there are people who are ardent anti-slave. And you're getting this growing, and this is what I mentioned earlier, that this wasn't going to last forever. You still have those, the growing clique of businessmen who see the continued expansion of slavery is a threat to their agenda, industrialization. And they don't want to compete with unpaid toilers. Well, if, if, if you look at the topography, you're going to grow cotton in Utah? Correct, you can. You can. Right. And even in the South, during the war, they were using slaves. They took them off the plantations to load and unload ships, load and unload trains, lay tracking, so on and so forth. And they didn't pay them for this. They didn't pay them for this. So it's interesting. Yes, you could have used them. Well, the Nazis did this with slave labor later on. Right. And so this idea of slavery is virtually universal. Or even to the extent that when you go back to the Abbasid Caliphate back in, back in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, they, they were using slave soldiers. Turks they had captured, they turned them into soldiers. They're slave soldiers. Uh, also in the Middle East too, the Yanisaries, who were Christians that were captured, slave soldiers. The only problem with that is uh, and, the, and the Abbasid Caliphate found this out, you might have some of these Turkish slave soldiers who are very talented. Okay, well, we'll make Mustafa over here a, a, an officer, and we'll make Kamal over here an officer. What, do you keep do what happens when you keep doing that? Officers can, be a, officers can turn out to be a political clique. And so what eventually happens? 
these, these, these slave soldiers take over the Abbasid Caliphate. You know, that was smart. And, you know, it got to the point where the officer class took control politically, but they're telling the caliph, you know, in Islam, there's no separation between church and state. Okay, you see to the spiritual well-being of the flock, we'll take care of the rest. Well, what happened to the caliphate? It's an empty shell. Some of these justices wanted to throw it back to the house and let them, let them handle it. Yeah, Dred Scott wasn't going to win that decision. It's, he's not going to win that decision. Correct. Now, now, now you're getting into John Brown, who said the only way this country is going to be cleansed of its sins is what? War. Well, Harriet Tubman, don't forget, was in on the hel helping in the planning of the <laughs> John Brown's raid, although she wasn't there for it. But, uh, and John Brown called her General Tubman. Well, I think, you know, bouncing off of the two of you are saying here, you know, it's not just Dred Scott, it's the case of that Arthur Burns in, Baldwin, in Boston, which, which 1857. And so, you know, when he's, when he's, a, he's captured, trying to escape uh, slavery, uh, you know, he's going to be sent back south. All of a sudden, these people crawl out of the woodwork to keep him from being sent back. And you know, it's, as I mentioned, dozens, hundreds, it's a whole group. He got sent back. But, it, but, the, but then again, the, the, the average cost, supposedly, if you do your research, or the average cost was $100,000. The $100, by the time they get done getting the troops out, and by the time they ship them back, $100,000. It's the principle of the thing, she says. But, you know, the, but they enforced the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. You know, if the slaves, are, if the slaves escape, and they're recaptured, they get sent back. Again, it's to keep the country together. Uh, because if you didn't have that Fugitive Slave Act, now how, now how is Dred Scott? You know? So uh, the, the, by 18, you know, maybe Dred Scott's irrelevant at this point because without the Fugitive Slave Act, the North is not colluding with the South to maintain slavery. And so, yeah, so that's part of that legal progression that you're seeing develop. But, but then again, when you look at what you're saying here, you know, states' rights, uh, I mean, a cornerstone of our system is supposed to be consent of the governed. If you read your founders, consent of the governed. And so, but consent of the governed does not apply to the black man because he's not considered what? A citizen? Forget not being considered a human. He's property. He's not considered a citizen. So consent of the governed does not apply to the black man. Well, the, the way your country was structured, yes, you have your constitution, which is your blueprint for government. That's for the majority. Your Bill of Rights, though, protects you from the infringements of government, and that caters to who? The individual. Or a group of people. Still a minority. And so, but that goes back to what I mentioned earlier. You think you got a functioning system of representative government now? How much is the Constitution and Bill of Rights really resorted to? I mean, really resorted to. And so now you're in the same boat as the black man. How do you like that one? Yes. What's interesting, it's interesting here, you know, just prior to the war, going back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, there were 91 Democrats in the Northern, in, in, in the, you know, Northern uh, representatives in, in Congress, and yet, after like Dred Scott, the Arthur Burns incident, so on and so forth, <laughs> the next election is like 25. And so other parties are taking their place, like the Republicans, uh, the know-nothings for a short period of time. Uh, in the South, by the way, uh, Republicans, uh, you know, well, you're not going to have hardly any Republicans. It's going to be what? Democrats. And Dixiecrats, or if you want to call them that. Uh, Strom, yeah, here we go, Strom Thurmond. But however... You know, yes, when, in fact, interesting, 70, and in fact, I have it in here, 75% after the war, after Reconstruction, 75% of Republican voters in the South are black. So Repub Republicans, basically, in the South, that's a black party. That's a black party. And yet, when you get to the 1930s, what's happened? 
you know, and who's one of the major, uh, uh, the ma major, uh, ma major uh, people, uh, one of the, li the high line people here who moves the black from the Republican to the Democratic agenda, Eleanor Roosevelt. And so blacks move from the Republican to the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, rem yeah, I remember Strom Thurmond too. And I, and I, and I remember uh, Wallace. Um, interesting how he's a product of his era, his time, and his district. Well, when it came, when it, you know, when, when you had things like uh, the, back in the early 60s, like in Selma and Birmingham, Alabama, uh, you, you saw, and it wasn't just the South, it was national. And yet, at the same time, uh, back in 65, 66, when Martin Luther King went to Chicago, he said what happened to them in Chicago was worse than what happened down south. Uh, yeah, um, and he even got hit in the head with a brick in Chicago. Somebody, th who knows who threw the brick? Uh, he got hit in the head with a brick. A brick can kill you just as easily as a bullet. And, uh, but he stated, he even in his, in his writings that what happened in Chicago was just as bad, if not worse, than what was going on, what happened to us in Selma, Birmingham, Montgomery, so on and so forth. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, this, is a, this is a tumultuous period of time in the country's history. The civil rights movement, you know, the 50s and 60s, and then add what was going on, the backlash to Vietnam. If you remember back in the like from 65 on, and, and then when uh, King is assassinated in 68, what happened after that? Remember the riots, the cities, the burnings and so on and so forth? At the same time, you've got that backlash building to the war in Vietnam. And even to the point where not only is Martin Luther King, you know, at the, f at the spear tip of the civil rights movement at this point, he took on the Vietnam War too. Hmm. Inter interest interesting period of time here in, the, in, in this country's history in the 1960s. But then again, long-term progression, where does it come out of? The 19th century. Yes. Yeah. Uh, John Lewis. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so these issues, you know, are, you know, you know when you get back again, you, you, re you return to 1619, and the Dutch bringing the first 20 blacks here, and then the resulting slavery, the second-class citizen, citizens of blacks. It seems like racism in this regard is, is a stain in that American fabric. Has there been a detergent of atonement to get rid of it? Not yet. Not yet. And so, you know, I mean, go back to even, again, Martin Luther King here. He said he had a little white friend he used to play with, but once they got to be six years old, his white friend went to a white school, he went to a black school, and he said his white friend's father said, you can't play with him anymore. Well, you know, welcome to the real world here. No, he's not the only one I've, I've read that that's, that's happened to. Um, I've read that about Jewish, little Jewish, uh, a Jewish girl in Poland who, you know, who had Christian friends, but as soon as, as soon as the Nazis invaded, guess what? Don't play with that little Jew girl anymore. Uh, you know, what happened to my friends here? What friends? <laughs> you know. And you also had those people who do the same thing here in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s along that um, uh, Underground Railroad. Now, let's be honest here, where some of them really want to see blacks as equal citizens? No, but maybe they don't like slavery either. Going back to what you're talking about, beating people on the television screens and that kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the idea is, well, you know, go back to what Lincoln states here. You know, he's the equal as far as him earning his daily bread. Okay, that's fine, but we don't like slavery either. You know, you're keeping your fellow man in bondage here is really what you're doing. Yeah, it's always fun when you, you know, when you, I'm sure some of this happened to you folks too. I mean, 
We, we join a political party because our mother and fathers were part of that party. We, we, be, we join a religion because our mothers and fathers had us join a religion, whatever the case may be. And I remember the first time I could vote was 72, and I was a Republican, and I voted for George McGovern. And some people in my family said, you voted for who? I said, I voted for McGovern. Why would you do that for? I said, I voted for character. I said, I thought he had better character than Nixon did. I said, plus this is a guy who was flying B-17s over Germany and he knew what the hell he was doing. 25 missions. Right. Yeah, Jimmy Stewart did that stuff. And so uh, I thought, you know, why, why, you know, I just didn't think, I thought McGovern had a, had a I said, I voted for character for my, to be my president. I thought he was the right, better qualified than Nixon was. And, I mean, I'll admit I did vote for, I did vote for Jerry Ford, because I thought Ford would be better qualified as president than, than Carter. Although Carter's turned out to be more popular since he's been out of office. Um, well, you know, it be say, well, it won't be too hard. Well, Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You know, um, uh, so it's interesting how when some people are looked on when they're in office and then how they're looked upon after they're out. Um, <laughs> Ann Coulter likes them. Yeah, she kind of threw Trump under the bus. Didn't she? If he can't get his wall, he's done. I mean, I was, I was reading that. Boy, Ann Coulter, wow. Deserting the ship. The good ship Pequod. Let's get off. You were born in Ireland? Yeah, I remember I used to have a, well, he's a good deal older than you are, but. Yeah, I have a, I have a fellow who I knew was a kid, but he, he's John, Mr. Clary has passed now, and he came out of Ireland, and his family moved to England uh, just prior to the war. And he said, I remember, he says, Mark, I remember, uh, you know, signs in England, England, British here, Irish here. And he said when he came here stateside, he joined the United States Navy during the war, and he says, unbeknown, he says, I can't, he says, I don't have any, I don't have any say in this. He says, they attach me to the Atlantic fleet. He says, I was hoping I'd go to the Pacific. But he says, as a member of the United States Navy, he went to Britain. And um, he said, he said, Our, you know, that back in the war, you know, dock space is at a premium, so you had two ships tied up, and you walked across the fan tail of the ship next to the dock to get on the dock. And he said he would go ashore with Americans, you know, Ameri guys who were born here, uh, but he's still an American sailor. And, you know, some of these Brits would pick up the, uh, the fact that he was Irish. And he said, even though I was with, he says, though I was with a group of American sailors, he said, no one picked on me. Nobody. He says, I was considered an American sailor by, um, by Americans born here. And he says, I was treated as an equal. And so, uh, interesting, yeah, even, even though he, he said, and he still, up to the day he died, really didn't have a lot good to say about the British. And so he says, I know, and he made, the, he made that point to me, he says, I know how blacks felt. Yeah, it is, a, it is good. Uh, you don't have, you don't have, because uh, I used to get, the, my, I remember when, um, you know, you know when you go to like Niagara Falls or, or, uh, or the Empire State Building, you see those viewing machines, you put 50 cents in and you look through it. When I was a kid, it was a dime. My father put a lot of those in. And I remember we, uh, that we, remember we used to go to Playland down here in New York, and my father would go down and check the machines, collect the money. For me, it was a, for me, it was a day off. My father it was, you know, he was working. But the, the man that was running this place, a fellow named Jack, that's what I remember him as, he was... Irish. He was all, he oversaw playland for the state of New York. He was hired by the state of New York. That was his job. 
he was also an agent for the IRA. And being my father was Irish-American, part Irish-American, he was Swedish too, but, and Jack would say, hey, Bill, you want to make a contribution to, nope. But my father later on would tell me, I said, who is that guy? And my father explained when I was old enough to understand, I said, really? My father goes, yeah, once you get involved with that, that's it. And my father would say, nope, not, not, not going there. Because the guy was a collector for the IRA. And he was working, he oversaw Playland, Playland Amusement Park for the state of New York. But he was also a collector for the IRA. Interesting, here are the people you run into. Two weeks from today, Adolf Hitler. Another uplifting topic. Have yourselves a great evening.